Sridhar Ramakrishnan. Welcome to our webinar this month. Um, before we get started, a few bookkeeping items. The presentation will begin shortly and go on till approximately 1 p.m. Uh, as uh, before, Steve has consented to stay on for a bit after 1 p.m. to address any questions or dialogue that people may have. The slides in the recording will be end, available at the end of this presentation. Log into your Malibo account to view them. You can also go to our uh, YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Malibo TV. Um, please keep your telephone and microphone muted at all times. Uh, if you've dialed in by telephone, uh, you must have entered your audio pin. Otherwise, there's no way to, for me to unmute you in order to, if you need to ask questions. Because there's quite a number of attendees today, by default, what I'm going to do is keep everyone muted. If you need to ask a question, please uh, relay them to me by chat. Uh, if you prefer to ask a question directly, then um, you know, raise your hand. I will then unmute you. You can ask your question, etc. This way, we don't have a lot of noise in the background, etc. Okay, so we'd, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get uh, started. Today, we are delighted to have Steve Grant talk to us about uh, with the start with the webinar, I am not an algorithm. Steve Grant is a scientist and engineer at CyberLife Research, working in the fields of artificial life and biologically inspired artificial intelligence. He developed the best-selling artificial life computer game creatures, which received a number of awards. A committed uh, autodidact and interdisciplinary thinker, he has specific interests in computer science, computational neuroscience, artificial life, electronics, and robotics. His present research focuses on understanding the fundamental engineering principles that underlie the computational and self-organizing structure of the brain and the inspiration this may provide for future intelligent technology. He is the author of two books on artificial life and is a contributor in newspaper, television, and radio. He was nominated by the Sunday Times as one of the 18 scientists most likely to revolutionize our lives in the coming century, but takes this responsibility with a pinch of salt. Given that the Evening Standard once headlined them, as Britain's most intelligent man. He was awarded the Order of the British Empire by the Queen in January 2000. With that, uh, I'm delighted to turn it over to Steve. Steve, please unmute yourself and let's get rolling. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder, Shruta. I almost didn't press the button. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so I'm going to start, I'm going to try to explain the work that I'm currently doing um, in an area that I suppose you might want to call artificial consciousness or artificial imagery or something like that. Um, it's not especially difficult to understand, but it's a bit of an esoteric topic and uh, and to be honest, I've never actually tried explaining it before. So uh, so I think I need to start with quite a bit of context so that you can uh, see how it all fits together. Uh, but that does mean there's an awful lot to cover, so I'll probably have to speak really, really quickly, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, so I'm going to start with um, with a bit of a rant, a rant about artificial intelligence, and um, and then I'll take a quick glance at how biological machines tend to differ from man-made machines, and then I'll try to cram uh, five years of my life into about 30 seconds, uh, just to show you how these ideas can play out in practice. And then we'll look at how the human brain doesn't work. And then finally, we can get on to how I think the human brain may work and, and the ideas that I'm developing now. So, um, that's the right button. Okay, so I'm going to start out by being a bit mean to my hero. Um, this is Alan Turing, of course, and uh, in 1950, he felt brave enough to make this prediction that by the end of the century, uh, educated people would feel comfortable referring to computers as thinking. Well, it's uh, 14 years since the end of the century and uh, he ran out of time and, and basically it was wrong. Um, and, and maybe that's not such a bad thing because uh, by the year 2001, you know, the, the HAL 9000 series of computers were supposed to be having um, existential crises and locking us out of our spacecraft and stuff. Um, whereas, in fact, in reality, the only thing we, we were scared about as the year 2000 came round was uh, whether computers were too stupid to add up the date properly. But um, we certainly made what people like to call progress. Um, but I don't think it really is as much progress as it looks. Um, 
Sridhar mentioned in, in the write-up for this talk, uh, IBM's Watson computer, and, and that can beat humans at jeopardy. And, jeopardy. and, and, uh, and for years, of course, computers have played a mean game of chess. Uh, and, and these are really impressive feats, and I, I don't want to knock them, but I don't think either of them really has much to do with intelligence. In fact, I think it was probably Turing himself that kind of screwed things up uh, and changed the rules of the game. Uh, I think he was probably the first person to suggest that we should stop talking about making machines intelligent at all uh, and instead talk about making them do the things that we humans use intelligence to do, uh, which is a very different thing, but it's not widely appreciated how different that, different that is. I mean, uh, I use my intelligence to... Uh, to do arithmetic, and a pocket calculator can do it much better than I can, but that doesn't usually uh, be taken to mean that I'm, I'm not so smart as a pocket calculator. So um, I thought I'd illustrate this point um, in a simple way. Uh, so imagine uh, a chess computer and imagine a perfectly standard rabbit and uh, pit them against each other. So, so this is what happens when you ask a rabbit to play chess. Um, they're really not very good at it, and uh, the queen's opening gambit gets them every time. And so on that basis, uh, chess computers are way smarter than rabbits. But if you try dropping them both into a bowl of water, it seems to me that the, uh, the one that's really intelligent is the one who figures out how not to drown. Uh, I've tried this experiment many times, and, and chess computers never seem to get the hang of it. So what can we gather from this? Well, one thing we might learn is uh, that maybe intelligence has something to do with things mattering, that it only really matters if there's a cost involved and some way to measure that cost. And uh, so rabbits can feel pain and they can feel fear. Uh, they're motivated to stay alive, whereas chess computers don't even know there's a problem to solve, and they, they just sit there and drain. And maybe it means that intelligence is a property of complete systems, that it's an integrated thing, and it can't simply be abstracted out. And so I like to say there's no such thing as half an organism, because if you take an organism and cut it in pieces to see how it works, what you usually end up with is a bunch of bloody entrails that don't work at all anymore. So it's no longer an organism. So organisms are integrated systems, and maybe intelligence is an integrated part of that. But probably the biggest thing is that uh, intelligence is about general purposeness. Um, there will always be a specialized machine that can do a a single job better than I can, uh, but at the same time I can do an infinite number of jobs really badly, and, and really that's a much more impressive and useful trait. And then finally, the experiment kind of hints at the idea that just because we find playing chess difficult while well, picking up the chess pieces is really easy, it doesn't actually follow that this is the intrinsic order of difficulty. Um, by the time a human baby is a year old, it can usually walk and talk and grasp things and see and get what it wants from its mother, and, and that's a, a phenomenal achievement. Uh, but we tend to assume it was easy, mostly because when we learned it, we were just babies, so it can't be that hard, can it? But trying to get a computer to do any one of those things it turns out to be a real nightmare. And it matters, too. Um, these supposedly easy skills turn out to be absolutely vital uh, for true higher intelligence to exist. I used to be really petrified of these Daleks uh, when I was a kid. I used to hide behind the sofa. But I don't know why, because if they ever do come and threaten us and want to take over the world, all we have to do is build a few steps um, or, or run across a muddy field or something because they can't climb or run. And we, we tend to massively underestimate the difficulty of, of these supposedly primitive tasks, um, especially things like seeing. And that's, that's largely because we're only really consciously aware of the output of what's really an incredibly powerful computing system. 
so we see the answers, but we don't see the working out. So we don't really appreciate how hard the, the problem is. So um, you probably don't need to be told this, but it, it's so easy to underestimate the difficulty of these things that uh, I thought I'd give you a quick demonstration. So, uh, oh, that's supposed to be a video, and it isn't videoing. I'm not sure why. I hope that doesn't happen later. Um, anyway, so what you can see on the right-hand side is an oscilloscope trace, and it's, this scope is attached to a TV camera, and the TV camera is pointing at a scene. And so the question is, what's the scene that the camera is pointing at? And obviously you don't have a clue. I mean, I certainly don't. Um, and yet that scope trace contains exactly the same information as the visual scene does. It's just that it contains it in a form that our visual systems don't know how to process. And it's only really when you look at the problem in that way, where you're not already looking at the answers, that you can appreciate the difficulty of, of the problem of, of vision. Um, and, and this matters in AI because of what's called the simple grounding problem. And in systems like Watson, the great at answering Jeopardy questions, but it doesn't necessarily really understand the answers. Um, it might know that the Canary Islands are off the northwest coast of Africa. It might know they speak Spanish there and, and grow oranges, but it's never actually been to an island. And uh, it's never heard anyone speak Spanish, and it doesn't know what oranges taste like. So its answers don't have any real meaning because they're just symbols defined in terms of other symbols. But the buck has to stop somewhere, and uh, eventually everything has to be experienced, or at the bottom level things have to be experienced, uh, rather than defined in terms of something simpler. And ideas like redness and cold and roughness, down, pain, I mean you can't intellectually feel pain. Um, so, so Watson is a great piece of work, and it may well have won Jeopardy, but did this make it happy? So I work in a field called biologically inspired intelligence, or biologically inspired artificial intelligence. Um, but I usually like to call it artificial stupidity because, um, because that's what it's about. It's, it's about these supposedly easy problems, uh, which are actually much harder to address and, and can be more important than answering general knowledge questions or, or playing chess. Uh, so why biologically inspired? Well, uh, mostly because living things are the only only example we have. Um, in in the space of all possible machines, there might be many regions where intelligent systems exist, but we don't have a clue where they are. And so it kind of makes sense, since animals are machines, uh, to start looking from that point. But also, I think. Biology is quite a different way of looking at things compared to, say, mathematics or, or engineering. And, uh, and sometimes a new way of looking at things is what you really need. So I thought I'd just list a few of the uh, simpler differences between the kinds of machines that we design and the kinds of machines that nature designs. Uh, so the most obvious difference is that living things are usually massively parallel. And, and I do mean massively parallel. I'm not just talking about a few hundred GPU nodes here. We're talking tens of trillions of parts. And yet, they still manage to work. And um, so I, I don't know whether you've thought much about this, but, but it's worth pointing out that you are actually a colony of single-celled animals. Um, and over 90% of, of the cells that make you up aren't even related to your parents. I mean, they're bacteria um, who happen to live in your gut and on your skin. But you can't live without them. They're, they're a vital part of you. Um, and, but even the 10 trillion cells that, that are related to your parents, the human cells, um, they're really just single-celled animals that happen to be glued together by a sticky substance and not always glued together. I mean, the white cells in your blood are just little amoebae that swim up and down your bloodstream eating bacteria. So they're, they're, they're really quite independent little animals. 
and it's a, a weird thing to think about. Um, not nearly as weird as slime molds, but I won't get onto that. Um, and yet nobody's in charge uh, of these systems. Um, there's no CEO at the top. Uh, there's not even a network manager who's, you know, desperately trying to prevent everyone from installing games on their PCs in case a virus makes the whole system fall over. Um, and if if a virus does come in in a natural machine, then this huge complex system swings into operation uh, without anyone there to give the command, and it mops up the infection. And uh, again, it's one of those things that we're not not really aware of. I mean, our, our immune system is working like crazy all the time. And uh, if it didn't work 24-7, we, we would rot within a week, like a dead body does. Um, so one of the reasons, and it's a rather subtle reason, for, for the, the way that natural systems are robust and not brittle uh, is the direction of control. And, um, the closest we get to it in programming, I think, is, is object orientation, uh, which is very much like cellularity in, in the sense of dividing things up and isolating them from each other. Uh, but even in object orientation, we still call methods on other objects. We still command them to do something. And so that means we need to know that they're there, and we need to know something about the interface. But biology doesn't usually work this way. Um, cells don't tell each other what to do. They just scan their local environment and react to change. And then that changes their environment in response, and another cell will notice this change, and, and so on. It's completely localized, and everybody's completely disconnected from everyone else. And it's, it's quite a subtle difference, I think, but, but quite important. Uh, so biology is also incredibly messy. Um, I could give you an example of that, but I think it'll take too long. So just take it from me that messy is good. Um, it's also analog. Um, we've pretty much forgotten how to make analog computers now, which is a shame, I think. Um, but the most important difference is that uh, nature's machines are, are self-organizing. Um, and in a way, the study of biology is, is essentially the study of self-organization. Um, and I think there's still a lot to be learned by technologists uh, from how systems self-organize, or well, there would be if only we knew a bit more about it. Uh, and, and there's something kind of special about the way the building blocks of biology are, are organized. It's, it's hard to pin down, but um, again, it's kind of like object orientation. Uh, you, you have uh, inheritance in, in Group, but um, but in biology, the building blocks tend to be configurable more than heritable, uh, and it's again, it's a subtle difference, but it makes a it has an effect. Um, so basically, life is significantly different, and and computers are probably the wrong way to think about bottom-up, parallel, analog machines because they're serial, top-down, digital machines. Um, but the, although they're the wrong paradigm of thought, uh, that doesn't mean you can't use them to simulate populations of other kinds of computational objects. So, so if you work in my field, you, you, you eventually stop thinking about the computer as a machine for, for executing instructions and instead start to think about it as a sort of space in which to build other kinds of machines. All right, so this is the quickest possible overview of five years of hard work, uh, just to show these ideas kind of working in practice. Um, way back in 1992, I, I started writing a simulation of life, and um, not, not a simulation of life like behavior, but a simulation of non-living things, biological building blocks, uh, like enzymes and chemoreceptors and uh, neurons and genes. And then I use those blocks to construct life. So that's, that's a very different thing from simulating behavior itself. And um, so this was a video game. It was called Creatures. Uh, it came out in 1996. And 
there wasn't any point to it. I mean, it's not like you could win it or anything. It was just some little artificial life forms for people to play with and look after. And they could learn things. They could figure out how to play with toys and uh, go up and down in elevators and get on a boat and that kind of stuff. And eventually they'd fall in love and uh, reproduce and have children and sometimes beat the crap out of these children. And, um, so it's definitely artificial stupidity. I mean, they're never going to win Jeopardy, but uh, in an important sense, I, I think they were real creatures. Um, so here's just an example of some parts of their internal structure, just to give you an idea. So um, over here we have uh, their reproductive system, or the female reproductive system, and so it's made up of enzymes and receptors and emitters and and that kind of stuff, and, and they combine together to make an oscillator, so there's a sort of ovulatory cycle, things like that. Um, this is the very, very simple digestive system. Um, and then all of these systems, digestive system, immune system, reproductive system, and so on, uh, could interact with their brain also via chemistry. So there was a big network of chemical reactions that control pain and pleasure and punishment and reward. Uh, and then their brain itself was made from something like a thousand neurons. Um, at least it started out as a thousand neurons because, uh, because the creatures could evolve and so eventually all sorts of different kinds of brains showed up that seemed to work in different ways but uh, I never quite really understood most of them. But the important thing is they still worked. Um, so, so what we've got here is, is a kind of set of building blocks, Lego bricks, um, that are similar to biological ones. And then I use genetics as a kind of programming language to assemble these things into, into networks and make something that had emergent behavior, that behaved as if it was alive. Um, I suppose that the only lesson I want to draw out of it really is that this was pretty complex system, a um, quarter of a million lines of code, I think. Uh, but it didn't really fall over very often. It didn't suffer from heavy bugs and difficult bugs and things, uh, which was quite surprising, really. But, um, but it makes sense, because biology is inherently robust. And this was a simulation of biology. And so the simulation was robust, too. Steve, I have a question. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I, I guess I can make this quick. Um, you know, obviously life is a lot more complicated than creatures, right? So mm -hmm. the question was, how did you choose that particular subset of uh, of uh, subsystems or processes within biology to simulate? That's a very good question. Uh, it, it, because it worked, because I needed those things. So I came at the problem from the perspective of an engineer rather than a biologist. I didn't look at chemical networks and, and say, oh, well, I need to have this hormone and that enzyme and these receptors and so on. I started from the problem of how do you manage energy? How do you have a storage system for energy? How do we get oscillators to come out of the system so that we can have things like reproductive cycle? And then um, I found that there were biological analogs for these things. Uh, and so I gave them names. And then, so, so when I talk about gonadotropin or something like that, uh, I'm not really talking about the chemical explicitly. I'm just talking about something that's just functionally similar. And so, so it started with the need, and then out of that uh, came the biology, if you see what I mean. Yeah, thank you. And so this isn't really relevant to my point, but I just, I just wanted to point it out that, um, that it wasn't just an academic exercise. This was a, a, a real commercial product. and. It sold over a million copies, and people really got into it. Um, I still quite often hear from people who chose careers in biology or computer science because of what they got out of this game, or, or maybe more accurately, what they put into it, because uh, they did some pretty impressive things, like adoption agencies and equivalents of the Human Genome Project and so on. Um, and, and even now, 20 years on, uh, there's still a, a significant community of people who have a, an anniversary every year, and, uh, and they're experts on non-biology and non-psychology. 
Um, and, and because the system's emergent and evolving, I think most of them know far more about it than I do now. So, so I'm, I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I'd just written code that tried to behave as if it were alive. It's the fact that I set out to try to make life that, that made it all work. So, um, Creatures was something of a hit and uh, all of a sudden big blue chip companies started knocking on the door and, and scientists from a whole bunch of disciplines seemed to get quite worked up about it. So I figured it was probably worth following up uh, to see how far I could take the, the principles. Um, Creatures was, was fairly interesting, but, but I avoided a lot of really thorny problems and, and the way the creatures' brains work was really irritating. I mean, it was pathetic and I'm ashamed of it um, because they work, they, they learn for themselves, they have fears and joy and they get something out of their little lives, but they don't really think, uh, they just react. Um, so they aren't what I would define as conscious. Um, Richard Dawkins called them quasi-conscious, and, and I quite like the term, but um, but I think Richard was being too generous. I, I, I really don't think they're conscious in any meaningful way at all. So I, I set out to find out what was missing, um, and uh, I quite quickly started to come up with some ideas that I liked, and, and for a few years I, I tested them out with uh, Lucy here, this little robot. Um, and she became quite famous, in fact, but, um, but all I ever managed to do was to, to get her to learn how to recognize bananas. Um, but she taught me a lot, though, and she opened up some interesting avenues. And uh, it just turns out that you can't really make a living from building robot orangutans. So uh, although she was interesting, uh, I had to stop with the robots, and a couple of years ago, I decided it was time to start writing a new game. So, so something just like Creatures, but but um, but using modern 3D technology and physics engines and stuff, and um, plus to develop the new ideas that, that Lucy had helped me think up. And um, so, I'll skip over Lucy, and and um, I want to try to explain the new ideas. But but first, we need a, a kind of idealized model of how the brain doesn't work uh, for contrast. Um, and obviously there's been lots and lots of theories of the brain and, um, and I don't mean to demean them, but to simplify things, they basically fall into two different categories. And uh, the first category says that the brain is basically a computer, um, perhaps with a separate memory and processor and I.O. and that kind of stuff. And that's actually a bit ironic and a bit recursive because uh, computers were designed in the, first, in the first place to mimic how people thought the human mind works. Um, but either way, it's not true. Um, there's no real evidence that brains are much like computers in any meaningful respect. Um, so the other class of model that tends to come out is, is what you might call the connectionist model. And um, unlike the computer idea, this one's more strongly grounded in neuroscience rather than psychology. And um, so all, all the parts are kind of justifiable individually. Uh, but I just don't think that it's the right way to put them together. Um, so you can see that, that the basic assumption is that sensory data kind of flows in at one end of the system and gets abstracted as it moves through these various modules and gradually different kinds of sensory data get bound together. Um, something called perceptual binding. Uh, so, so, you know, color and shape, say. And then at some point, mysteriously in the middle, um, what was gradually more abstracted sensory data starts to become a decision, uh, a, a motor choice. And then the motor data starts to become less abstracted and more detailed as it flows out the other end of the machine and, and drives the muscles. And then you get feedback through the environment. And it's, it's interesting to note that in this sort of model, that's the feed forward direction. And 
feedback comes through the environment, which is a bit strange really because senses are there to provide feedback. Um, that's what senses are for. Um, so I'm being a bit unfair to, to, to a lot of very hard won theories by, by squeezing them down into a sausage machine analogy, but, um, but it's not a bad general picture of how people tend implicitly to assume the brain is wired up, um, except that I don't think it can actually be the case. So if we look at some actual cortex, we can hopefully see why. So this, this picture over here is a section through the cortex of the brain, and um, so the skull would lie out there, and this white, these white regions are called the white matter, and they're the, the wires that connect the different parts of cortex together, and this is the gray matter where all the cell bodies and the more localized interconnections exist. And as you can see, the, the, the gray matter is, has a layered appearance to it. And that's a, a bit misleading, um, but, um, but generally speaking, people uh, tend to assume there are six, about five or six layers uh, in cortex, and um, there's a characteristic structure to them. Um, so, so if you look at this, this picture here, this is a slice through the gray matter in primary visual cortex, and you can see the, the six layers and some subdivisions in layer four, and the inputs and the outputs uh, to, the, to the various layers. Um, but the thing is, this, this is not like a sausage machine. It doesn't really work out. Um, you have to have the eye of faith somewhat, because you have to start thinking about what these six layers represent what kinds of inputs and outputs they have and how it sort of compresses down to a simplified model. And that simplified model is really a four-layer system. But when you look at the wiring, you find that sensory information tends to come in at layer four in the middle, and then some information comes out of layer three and goes into layer four of another bit of cortex, and then out of layer three and into layer four again. Now, if this was the sausage machine model, then we'd expect the muscles to be attached to this end, but they're not. They're attached to this end, or at least they're attached at various points, but they seem to be on a completely separate flow of information that comes in at layer one, out at layer five and six, in at one, five and six, one, five and six. And you quite often find motor outputs even in primary sensory areas of the brain, which just doesn't fit with the idea of sensory information going in at one end and out of the other. So it's not that it, it feels like a very different topology to me. Uh, the, there is a sensory stream and a motor stream, but they're, they're not arranged one after the other. They, they run in opposite directions and in parallel. So I call them yin and yang, um, for want of a better set of terms. Uh, and so if you cut out a thin layer through this hypothetical cortex, what you end up, end up with is, is a kind of module that has four streams of information, uh, upcoming yin, upgoing yin, downcoming yang, out, downgoing yang. Um, so that, there's a long story attached to all that, but, but it kind of gradually dawned on me that I, I thought I recognized uh, this, this configuration. Um, it's a bit weird because the thing I, I thought it was only has three sets of signals uh, and I need four, but the fourth one actually makes sense when you, when you see how they connect together. So, um, so the idea that I had was that, that this is rather like a servo motor. Um, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with servos, but if you've seen a model aircraft, you'll see servos used in there to, to control the flaps and the ailerons and the elevator and so on. Um, so the little electric. Sorry. A, a quick question that's coming online. I okay. guess the concept of uh, the concept of yin yang taken from the traditional positive negative connotation in Chinese. Is that correct? Uh, very loosely, yes. <laughs> I had to come up with with some kind of dualistic term, and, and yin and yang came to me, and it seemed to fit the bill. But uh, but don't take it too literally. 
but yes, they're, they're, they are complements to each other. They're a system in tension, and and the and the relationship between the Chinese concept and and this is actually quite apt, I think. And, and I've stuck with those terms ever since because I just got used to calling them that. Uh, so, so a servo motor is just a little electric motor, and it has a variable resistor on it that can tell it tell you which way the shaft is pointing. And so it has a sensor. It has a sensory input, just like we need in Cortex. Um, it also has what you might call a desire input, which is information about which direction we want the uh, the motor to point, the shaft to point. So then in between that, there's a little differential amplifier which compares where the motor is pointing with where the motor is told to point, it works out the difference, and just and figures out how much energy and what direction to send, put current into the motor to drive it towards that point. So you've got a desire input coming down, you've got a motor input going down, and you've got a sensory input coming up. So it's pretty similar to um, the kind of structure I, I was looking for, except for the one thing is that we don't have a sensory output going up. But that actually makes sense if you think in the broader terms about what a servo is for, what it does. And um, so um, suppose instead of, of just being able to pick up the motor position from a resistor, uh, the system had to recognize which way the motor is pointing by looking at uh, a camera or, or something that has several streams of sensory input. So it's basically a pattern recognition problem. It has to figure out, it has to compute something from several sets of sensory input to decide which way the motor is pointing in order that it compare, can compare it with this single desire input and, and drive the motor to a new place. Now, if that's the case, then you've got multiple sensory inputs coming in. And when you've computed them to work out the state you're in, you've actually got a single output, which is now useful for another servo. Um, it can pr provide part of the sensory input for another servo to use to recognize a higher level pattern. So you can imagine ganging these servos together. And, um, and in fact, that's what an autopilot does. Uh, it's a series of gang servos. And, um, and so initially, I started making a model aircraft and trying to teach it to fly, which was great fun. Um, and then it crashed on national TV, and I kind of went cold on the project. But, but, um, but in any case, a, a, an autopilot is quite a linear problem, and uh, I was interested in vastly more nonlinear problems. But, but the idea seemed to make some sense, because um, all, all sorts of aspects of intelligence can be thought of as a servo action, uh, what biologists would call homeostatic. Um, so if, if, if you want to phone out for pizza, say, you, you desire pizza and you don't have any pizza, and so you want some, you need to phone out. Well, you need to bring the state of the world into line with your desire. Uh, so pizza has to arrive, which is a servo action. But in order to do that, you need to pick up the telephone. And in order to pick up the telephone, you need to desire the telephone to be in your hand. And um, it's not in your hand. So some other part of your brain needs to figure out how to bring reality into line with the desire, how to put the telephone in your hand, which involves reaching out and grabbing it, which involves minimizing the distance between where your hand is now and where you would like your hand to be. So all the way down through the chain, you've got a series of servo actions. Um, and one servo will provide the desires for several other servos, which will provide the desires for several other servos, and eventually it will ripple out to the muscles. So it was quite an interesting model. And, uh, and maybe that's what we see in the, in the peculiar non-sausage machine wiring of the brain. Um, I, I'm probably completely wrong from a neuroscience point of view, but um, the more I thought about it from an engineering point of view, the more interesting it seemed to become and, and uh, the more it seemed like it was worth following up. Uh, so that, that brings me to maps. Um, one thing we do know for sure about the brain uh, the cortex of the brain is that it's a patchwork of maps. Um, the larger ones are called Brodmann areas, and, and you can see the different Brodmann areas labeled on this diagram. So 
Um, so a map is, is some aspect of the sensory or the motor world, um, and it's arranged in some characteristic coordinate frame. So if you look right at the very back of the brain in the occipital lobes, you see area 17 uh, of E1, which is the primary visual cortex. And when you look at the structure of primary visual cortex, you find it's mapped out in just the same way as our retina, more or less. Um, so it's a spatial arrangement, a spatial coordinate frame. And you can actually you know, project a pattern onto the retina of a, of a monkey and see the pattern show up on the surface of the brain. Um, it's just a distorted pattern because we have far more photoreceptors in the middle of our eye from, from the edge and, uh, and because also this map encodes angles and orientations and, and spatial frequencies and things. So this primary uh, coordinate frame is spatial. And then if we look over here, this, this thin strip down here is called the motor strip. And that's also a map of something spatial. In this case, it's a map of the muscles of your body. Uh, and they're arranged in a logical sequence as well. So down here is the region that controls the muscles of the face, and up here is the region that controls the muscles of the toes and feet. So you have this, what's called a motor homunculus, a little, a little person turned upside down, mapped across the body of, of the brain. So, but, but some of these, so those, those are both um, very literal mappings, but there are also more um, abstract mappings. And so down here, there's, there's um, I think down there, there's uh, an area that maps out different um, facial expressions, for example. And it, it, the chances are it has neutral expressions in the middle, and then they you know, grade off into happy expressions on one side and angry expressions on the other, or something like that. Um, and there's even probably a map of fruit and vegetables uh, in the temporal lobes of the brain. And we kind of get a hint of that because there's a, a very rare disease called fruit and vegetable agnosia um, in which a person can't name fruit and vegetables. Uh, they're, they're fine with every other kind of food, but if you hand them a banana, they can't tell you what it is. So, so that's a hint that, that perhaps some localized damage has wiped out the bit of their, of their food map. Um, so the thing about maps is that they, they, they define a, a common territory of meaning um, in which you can place different kinds of markers to mean different things. So, so on a real map, um, the map itself might consist of contours that tell you the shape of the landscape. But then we can place a pin in the map to show where we are now. And we can place another pin into the map to show where we want to get to. And then the map helps us to work out the easiest route to take from, from A to B. And that's, that fits very nicely with the idea of a servo. Um, so, so one pin in a map might represent where our hand is in space. Uh, not calculated directly, but calculated from all the different pieces of information that come up from our proprioceptors about our joint angles. So it's quite a complicated calculation to work out where your hand is in space from your joint angles. But once you've got it, you can put a pin in the map at that point and say, that's where my hand is. And then you might have another pin to say where in space we want our hand to be next. Um, and so the map could not only encode how to recognize where it is, but also what we need to do to drive the various muscles to reach that point. And um, it's taken me several years to figure this out, but it turns out those, are two, those two things are exactly the same thing. It's just one is the reverse of the other. It, it kind of surprised me, and I still don't entirely believe it, but it works. Um, so, so a map can make a servo. Um, and it can be a very non-linear servo because it's a map. It's not just an equation. Um, and, and there's other important things we can represent on the surface too. So we might, for example, represent how we feel about being in each state, how we feel about bananas, or how we feel about having our hands stuck behind our head. Um, and that's useful information that, that that now makes sense because we have this territory, this, this coordinate frame in which to define it. Um, so the more I worked on this idea, the, the more powerful it seemed to become. Uh, but there's still two 
tricky questions I haven't talked about, and, and, and I think the answer to them is actually quite thrilling, uh, and I hope I can explain it. So, if you're following me so far, um, one of the questions you might be wondering is, uh, so if you phone out for pizza, who decides to do that? Um, is there somebody in charge? Because because uh, that would be really embarrassing, given what I said about how biological systems never have anyone in charge. Uh, but but does it all have to ripple up to the top, and then somebody at the top decides I want pizza, and then it all flows down, and everyone does as they're told? Well, no. Um, it it turns out that everybody is in charge. Um, in in this model, um, the brain is essentially a a rich collection of of learned reflex arcs. So, so although some of those arcs are, are up near the top, um, and so represent very abstract uh, choices, uh, like should we phone out for pizza, um, and we might call those executive regions, and they tend to be the kinds of things we're conscious of. The same thing can apply at any point in the in the hierarchy. And in a, as a general principle, information flows up and then down again as soon as it's possible to try to make something happen. Uh, so information coming in up about the position of a, of a stimulus in our visual field uh, might have to go up a couple of steps until it's been converted in from, into information about where that stimulus is in relation to our body. Uh, but then it can flow straight back down again and control the movements of our head and the movements of our eyes until we look at it. So that tends to happen spontaneously and uh, actually we tend to lie to ourselves about that. Um, if, if, uh, if a bird flies past the window right now, the chances are you'll, you'll look at it. And, and if I ask you why you looked at it, the chances are you'll say, well, because I wonder what it was. But actually you didn't. Um, the information doesn't get up far enough, quickly enough. Uh, you've already looked by the time you're aware of the bird. Uh, and this is actually happening below even cortex. This is happening in the superior colliculus of the thalamus. Uh, that a system has decided to turn your, head, your eyes and your head towards the, the stimulus. And then you just kind of post-justify it, post-rationalize it afterwards. Um, so, so one thing I haven't really talked about is, is that every map in this model um, also contains information about how the map finds that it tends to feel when it's in certain states. And, and there's two, two uses for this in the model. Um, firstly, a map might come to the conclusion that it wants to be in a particular state. You know, it, it knows that being in this state reduces hunger and we're hungry at the moment, so maybe we should do this. And so it might generate a kind of speculation. It might say, do this, do this, phone out for pizza, and tell them that's beneath it, that they should phone out for pizza. But it doesn't tell them straight away, OK, go do it. It speculates. It, it has an urge. And so it sends a very weak signal down through the system saying, kind of phone out for pizza. And, but then the maps beneath that, they also have this layer that tells them how they feel about doing various things. And it might turn out that, the thing at the top really, really, really wants to have some pizza, uh, but somewhere lower down that controls your legs and you have to get up to go and find the phone um, says you're too tired. No, I don't want to get up. And so it might then feed some information back up the in circuit, back up through the sensory system, carrying data about how it and its children feel about the thing that this map is trying to do. And if if it feels negative about it, then it'll it'll wipe out the urge. But if it feels positive about it or, or neutral, then the urge will gradually build up and eventually it will become strong enough to actually cause those actions right out to the periphery and cause some, some actual muscles to move. Um, so, so, that, that, so that means there's a kind of brief period where everybody in the system who has an opinion about what to do gets their chance to, to voice it. And then collectively, they sort of decide the best course of action. And that, that's almost like thinking. It's, it's, I don't know whether you've noticed that kind of brief moment uh, just before you make a decision, where you have an urge to do it, and it's building up in you, and yet you, you feel like you could veto it at any moment. But you're not consciously thinking about the, 
the options, you just feel you need to do it, and then something tells you, no, you don't want to do that, you want to stay on the couch, and, and so you veto it, and that, that might be what neuroscientists uh, call a readiness potential, and, and it's kind of like thinking, but it's not real thinking because it's very brief, and it's not what we really mean when we, we say we're thinking about something. And so for that, we need a second kind of reflection. This is, this is top-down reflection, where the feedback comes up about how you feel, and it either reinforces or weakens your opinion about how you're urged to do it. But, um, OK, so, so suppose, suppose one of these maps is considering an action that involves a whole sequence of events. So it knows that to get from the state A that it's currently in, to the goal state C, it has to first of all tell its children to do the things that will take it to state B, and then it can do the things that take it from B to C. So, so if we assume that a higher map is, is considering phoning out for pizza, say, and, and it wants to know how all the other maps feel about this, it can't actually get very good information now, because it can have an urge to, to take the first step of the sequence and it can find out how everyone else feels about that, but it can't find out about the latest steps. So it can't tell whether it needs to do something painful in order to reap a, a later reward. And it can't do that because it can't ask them to do the thing that they need to do next until it knows that they've done the thing it needs to do first. So, so to, to solve that problem, what we need to do, and what our brain needs to do, is to simulate the whole plan, uh, to rehearse it in our heads. And so I asked myself whether my design could do this, and, and it turns out it really easily can. Um, because in order to pretend that you've done something, and therefore take part in the simulation, all you have to do is to feed your, your goal state back up as your sensory output. Because when you've achieved what you're, when you've really achieved the thing that you're, you're being asked to do, you'll be in the state that, of the goal that you're given. Uh, so your, your sensory state will be aligned with your goal state. And so if you want to pretend that you've done that thing uh, without actually doing it, all you have to do is reflect back your goal as if it were your sensory output. And that means the map above now thinks that that part of the, of the thing has been carried out. And if everyone's doing it, that means that it very quickly thinks that the first step of the plan has already been executed. So that's the sensory information that it needs to trigger the second step of the plan, and uh, then everyone pretends to have done that too, and so on. So, so the, the net result of that is that you then get feedback coming up from how everyone feels about every step of the plan, and therefore you can work out how you feel about the whole thing uh, in general. And um, Eventually, it'll build up and, and, uh, and uh, become a real decision. But before that point, you're rehearsing it. You're thinking it through. You're imagining it. And uh, so, so it's a really simple solution. And yet, it means that the entire network is, is capable of acting out a series of events in its mind uh, to see what will happen and to see how it feels about it all. And, and what's that if it's not imagination? So I, I don't know what consciousness is, um, but I do know where it lives. And because as conscious beings, we don't live in the real world at all. Uh, if, if we did, we'd constantly be living in the past because of the time it takes to receive and process the sensory signals. So instead, we live in a virtual world inside our heads, which is a simulation of the world. And, and much of that time, much of the time, that simulation matches up with reality, but tries to run a little bit ahead of it. Um, so that you can anticipate what's going to happen. But sometimes, it, if it's got the time, it can take a step back from reality and predict further into the future by mentally rehearsing the plan to see where it leads, and that's what that is. And then sometimes, of course, our, our, we just free wheel and, and we daydream and, and invent things and come up with theories of the brain and that kind of stuff. So, so whatever consciousness, consciousness is, which is a philosophical question, that's where it lives. It lives in the simulation inside our minds. Uh, and I think that's probably why it evolved in the first place. And the exciting thing is my model seems to produce it. Um, 
So, uh, how are we doing for time? Uh, we're getting, getting on a bit. All right, hopefully this is a video. Um, why am I not seeing? I just want to show you that some of this actually works. Uh, do you want to wrap up, uh, or should I? Should you? Can you take a question now? Uh, yeah, give me the question while I figure out how to get this video working. <laughs> okay, the question is: Have you explored the function of mirror neurons in brain simulation? Uh, yes, I have a friend who's an expert in mirror neurons, and um, uh, my my take on mirror neurons. Uh, is that they are not really special neurons so much at all. Um, they, they're just an example of this whole business of reflection, this whole business of, of simulating what's going on somewhere. It's just that because they happen to simulate what's going on in other people, we've noticed them, and, um, and so we pay them special attention. So, so I think mirror neurons may be uh, an aspect of a, a broader idea in the brain that's it's pretty much general. But mirror neurons are really fascinating and, and uh, you know, they not only enable us to model the world but they enable us to model other people and so put ourselves in someone else's shoes or, or rather put someone else in our shoes um, and simulate them as if we were them. And, um, and I think that's really fascinating but it's too far for me to go with, with this um, it's too complicated. <laughs> I'll have enough trouble getting perception in these creatures that mean they can recognize each other at all, let alone model each other. But it's a very interesting topic. Um, so you, you can ask questions if you like while I show this video, and then I'll talk over the top of it in the absence of any questions. So, so this, this another creature question. here is... Hey, sure. Go ahead. Um, what is the largest neural network that can be simulated at the present time? Uh, I don't know. Um, it depends on what you mean by neural network. Um, I think, oh, I've forgotten his name, but IBM's Blue Brain Project, um, they're, they're thinking in terms of millions of neurons, but, but they're going to use supercomputers to do it. I, um, the creatures, most neural networks that you see in academia are pretty tiny, you know, 16 neurons, uh, 64 neurons, that kind of thing. There aren't really many topologies that, that justify the use of very large networks yet. Um, my, my creatures have a thousand neurons. Um, and these creatures, it's, it's hard to say because the basic, the fundamental unit is not the neuron, it, it's the neural column, it's, it's a bit more complicated. But I, I'd estimate we're talking about a few thousand neurons at the moment and probably 50,000 to 100,000 neurons by the time the creatures are finished. So, so that's, that's doable within the processing power of a PC. I'm, I, I'm hoping to be able to have you know, a dozen creatures running in real time with 50,000, 100,000 neurons in them. Thanks. Uh, so, Steve, do you have uh, further, uh, did you uh, want to show the demo, or uh, are you pretty much wrapped up, or where are we on uh, in, in terms um, of the presentation? We're not doing too badly for time, are we? So, let me just go back through this, this video again, and I'll, I'll tell you what's going on. Because these are some little bits of of the creatures doing their thing, these, these um, yin and yang circuits. So, so, this creature has only got the parts of its brain that handle gaze control, and so it's it's seeing these beach balls out of the corner of its eye and, and looking at them. But it has to do several things in order to do that. It has to see where the ball is in terms of its retina and then convert that to a position in body space and then from that back to a head movement and an eye movement. And, um, obviously, you could write that in code really easily. Uh, so I've gone the hard way about it because there are probably 500 or 1,000 neurons involved in making that happen. Um, but the point is that the architecture that does that can do anything. It can do, it can make them walk. It can enable them to navigate in space, uh, learn about different kinds of food stuff, learn to control their their hands, and so on. Um, so, so this is a creature just proving that they can actually walk, uh, which is. <laughs> You would have thought that was fairly self-evident that they'd be able to walk, but it turned out to be a heck of a lot harder than I thought. 
because this is actually walking. This is not animation. Um, it, it is actually controlling about 50 pairs of muscles and interacting with a physics engine to walk. So it was quite a relief that they could actually do it. This one only partially learned to walk by itself. Um, and mostly it had instinctive help. So it was kind of pre-wired to do a lot of it, uh, which, which you know, most animals are, in fact. I mean, it's only humans that take a whole year to walk. Um, and then, then this is a creature actually learning sort of in real time. So what he's trying to do is to balance. He's trying to stay upright and then arrange himself for different attitudes. And obviously, you know, before he's learned anything, he's completely useless at it. Um, but um, after just, I don't know, two or three minutes, he's starting to adapt. He's starting to be able to stay stable. Still got the jitters. Every single joint on here has a servo in it. Um, and then there are another 10 or 15 servos involved in the, um, the mechanics of, of actually balancing and coordinating limbs. Uh, but he's doing a bit better. And then it takes about half an hour. And about, after about half an hour, he's, he's really quite stable. He can lean over to one side um, or the other side. And he can point his nose to the ground. And he can sit back on his haunches and that kind of stuff and stabilize himself. And, uh, and if you put him on a slope or a turntable and kept changing the attitude of the ground, his legs would now adapt in real time and stay upright. So it's a combination of that ability to balance combined with the ability to manage the legs to walk, combined with the ability to um, direct your gaze and move your head and eyes towards a, a visual stimulus. Combine those things together, and what you end up with is a creature that can walk up to an object that it sees. Um, so you, I'm gradually building up the hierarchy now of, of these different maps. Um, but I have a long way to go yet. I've been working on this two years. And I think I have another, at least another year to go yet. Uh, OK, so that's about all I've got to show you. So if you have any more questions, that's great. Uh, otherwise, I think we're about done. So uh, there are quite a few questions, Steve. Uh, I guess before we go to the questions, etc., for those of you who need to leave us, because a little bit over time, uh, thanks for uh, thank you for attending. Uh, please do fill out the survey um, for the seminar. That helps me both uh, tweak the technology, uh, etc., as well as uh, keep getting uh, you know great speakers and so on. That'll be uh, uh, I'd really appreciate that. Um, and I guess uh, let me just roll with the questions here, Steve. Do you have a few minutes? Are you able to stay for a little longer, Steve? Yeah, I have as much time as you need. Sorry, I went over a bit. I, did, I, I miscalculated. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. That's okay. A few questions have come in. Let me let me do that. For those of you who also want to ask questions directly of Steve, please. Um, you know, raise your hand and I'll unmute you and then I guess uh, you can ask a question directly. Otherwise, if you're happy with me relaying it, uh, please send them to me by chat. So. Uh, let me ask, uh, the first question is, how do we handle uh, fall tolerance? Um, it handles itself remarkably well. That, that's the thing that, that I, can't, I can't quite get a handle on to explain to anybody. But whenever you try to build biologically valid systems like this, you find out they are fault tolerant. They're, they're, they're well damped. Um, they're redundant. They just seem to mop up after themselves really well. And it's, it's, I, I was quite impressed. You know, I, I wrote a quarter of a million lines of code in Creatures, and there really weren't, you, you'd have thought that there would be incredibly um, convoluted bugs where everything affected everything else, and it was a nightmare to try to track it all down. But what I found that I had to do was actually take off my, my programming t-shirt and put on a white coat and pretend I was a doctor, because instead of things falling over uh, and breaking, they, they tended to get sick. And so that they kind of collapsed gracefully. And it just, it just seems to fall out of the way biology communicates between its, its parts. Now, I don't know that that answers the question. But it, it suggests that there's a, a useful area of research. There's a lot yet to be learned about why biology is so robust and fault tolerant and, and so self-healing. Um, let's see, and um, you know the person who asked the question can follow up as well if uh, if you if you desire. But I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, can you please comment on the complexity of the training method and how to update the weights of the neural network? 
Uh -huh. um, well, there is no training method. Uh, they learn for themselves in the sense that uh, they what they're looking for is statistical relationships uh, in their data. They're learning to map out. E each map is an individual creature in a sense. So it, its job is given the, its sensory information. It needs to form a self-organized map similar to a Cohonan map, but working in a different way that, that, um, that maps out the territory of all possible combinations of, of sensory pattern that it experiences. Um, and it can do that. It doesn't need a training set. It just experiences life. And because the different maps have different sensory inputs or, or they get inputs from other maps, that determines what information they have available to them. And all they have to do is, there's only two things they have to work out. One is how to make sense of the data in order to produce a map, how to, to, to define the territory and classify things spatially. And the other thing is what they need to do in order to cause their motor systems to uh, change the sensory state from one place to another state. And it turns out those two things are actually inverses of each other. And so it's a very simple kind of learning scheme. It doesn't require any training sets. Um, and it doesn't actually require synaptic weights either. Um, the, the, um, the neurons are somewhat more abstract than real neurons. Real neurons aren't a bit like most neural network neurons, as, as you probably know. Um, they don't have you know, 16, 64 synapses, they have 100,000 synapses. And um, so they behave more like a jelly than, than, than transistors. Um, it's as if every neuron is, is intimately connected to many, many, many of its neighbors. And that level of connection tends to decrease with distance. So I actually model it that way around. Each, each um, dendrite, each input to the neurons is actually a vector which determines its position in space on the map. And then it's sensitive to signals from all over the map, but they, they decrease the distance. Um, and that makes it much, much easier to migrate the neurons. So, so what I'm changing is not the synaptic weight, but the position of the, of the dendrites. So they move around the map and migrate around the map looking for the right place to represent the thing they want to represent or to cause the action they want to cause. Uh, does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> A bit of, it's a bit of an unusual neural network. It's neural and it's a network, but it's not a bit like a, a normal connectionist network. It's not a perceptron or um, kind of thing. Okay, let's see. There's another question here. Uh, what is the reward function used to encourage learning to walk in this video? Um, all the map has to do, well, the, the, the reward for a map is when it manages to do its two jobs. And its two jobs are, how do I classify my input? And how do I determine what output I need to produce in order to achieve, uh, to, to bring my input into line with the desire? And really, it's that second one is the only thing it needs to worry about. How do I, what do I have to do in order to bring um, the sensory input into line, literally move its vector around the space? Um, into line with the desire. And so that's the only reward it requires. It, it doesn't need, you don't need any extrinsic rewards, any kind of punishment and pain and, and pleasure reinforcement. Um, there will be that kind of reinforcement, but it happens at, at a much larger, higher level. So, so each map is just trying to figure out how it sh what it has to do to bring, bring its sensory input into line with its desire. And that's the only task it has. And all the maps are, they're not actually all identical. There, there are variants of them uh, for, for efficiency reasons. But basically, they're all identical. And they only vary what they learn according to what they're connected to. So, so walking consists of about 20 maps, something like that, plus all the ones controlling the muscles. And one of them will end up figuring out how to adjust the position, the lengths of the four legs in order to balance you. And another one will figure out what speeds the legs should be rotated at in order to to not stumble and, and get into a bounce because of the, the physics of the creature and things. But you don't have to tell them that. They, they pretty much figure it out for themselves. It's where they are determines what they end up doing, if you see what I mean. 
Okay, there's one more question. This looks interesting. Uh, is overlearning ever an issue? Um, is fixed structure neural network used? Um, the, the, is overlearning ever an issue? No. Um, not really. Um, they partly because of this this basis function because because of the way that the dendrites are just vectors in space and they they can move continuously they're constantly being pushed and pulled they don't tend to get locked into into shape in the way synaptic weights can do um, the, there is a bit of a problem initially when when because the basis of it is a self organizing map um it does tend to um to settle on a, a particular topology too quickly, and I had to, t to do quite a lot of work to make sure that it was fluid enough to keep on being plastic later into the creature's life when it's had more experiences. But but um, it's kind of complicated to answer questions like this because I actually have several different kinds of maps. They're, they're all philosophically the same kind of map, but, but in practice they, they use somewhat different techniques because I have to get this to run in real time. But the most generic method of learning is really learning by observation. Um, the creature tries something, the map tries something, and then it learns what happened to its input state. Um, and it disregards what it was intending to happen to its input state. It only worries about what actually happened. And now it's got a record of a state transition, um, which it can then you know, build upon, and because that uh, it's a completely analog process, we're we're dealing with vectors in space, not not discrete synapses with with, with weights. Um, it doesn't tend to overlearn; it tends to stay so stay very fluid, and and gradually just becomes more representative of the statistics of the the problem. Uh, what was the other part of that question? Um, let's see. Um, I think the other part was. Uh, I think I have uh, unfortunately deleted the question. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the I think it has part, answered enough. Yeah. So, um, will the uh, Hong will you will you uh, either enter the question or uh, unmute you and you can ask the question directly? Oh, actually, yeah, Hong. Let me just unmute you. You can ask the question. Uh, Hong, can you ask it? Okay. So the, the the second part is is fixed uh, is fixed structure neural network used? Uh, you, Yes, it's a very strange architecture. Um, you, you kind of have to, to forget everything you know about neural networks. Uh, it's not like the classical neural networks that, that grew out of perceptrons in, in almost any respect. Um, and it is much more biologically driven as a, as a design. But it's a very, it's, each, each map consists of a series of layers. Um, and so, so there's the affect layer, for example, which it, its job is to record how you feel or what happens to how you feel, all your various drive changes, uh, whenever you transit into a particular state. So, so it has a completely independent task from all the other layers, um, and it works in a different way. So there's a very fixed architecture in, in terms of the affect layer, and another architecture in terms of the yang layer, which which the output layer that that determines what output pattern to produce in order to you know, bring the input into line with the desire and so on. Um, so it's, it, it's a pretty fixed architecture and a fairly um, heterogeneous one. It's not, it's not like a perceptron or anything that grew out of perceptrons. It, it has quite a structure to it. And, and I often don't even represent um, some of these functions neurally. Uh, sometimes you know, straightforward mathematics, because they're vectors in space, um, straightforward mathematics is often a lot quicker um, than, than actually having hundreds of neurons to do something you could do with a simple arithmetic. But um, so, so I kind of specialize these maps for somewhat different tasks. But, but the generic form is a series of tissues arranged in layers, and um, each layer has its own specific rule about how it adapts because it solves a specific aspect of this whole process, um, including the stuff that flows up and down the network in terms of you know, how the children feel about something, building up a, an urge, um, reflecting um, simulations, and that kind of stuff. It's pretty complex. 
it's horribly complex. <laughs> it's scarily so, uh, complex. Right. Um, so, Steve, I guess where do you see your? Um, I, I, you, you indicated that you still had about a year's worth of work in this, uh, but I'm assuming the broader problem still, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 as you said, is sort of eerily complex or scarily complex. What, what do you see as the biggest challenges that you're going to sort of focus on in the next uh, little bit? Uh, well, this is not not the answer you want to hear, but the. the the true biggest challenge I've had throughout the whole process is the damn physics engine. Um, and I'm, I, I'm using the Unity game environment to, to do the 3D and it, and it uses um, NVIDIA's physics engine. And the physics engine was designed for explosions and you know, like rag dolls and that kind of thing. It wasn't really designed for complex um, chains of, of limbs. Um, behaving like muscles and, and it keeps falling over. The, the, the math behind the physics engine has caused me no end of grief. So, so, uh, so getting the stupid creatures to walk turns out to be a lot harder, not because there's anything wrong with my theory, but because the physics engine doesn't behave properly. Um, but I, th I, think, I think I've solved all the key problems now after two and a half years of actual work and, and 15 years of thinking about it. Um, so I now have a complete system. The 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 the, the unknowns, the, the the weakest parts of my idea are, are in the the parts that were in those last two slides about stuff being reflected back down to actually cause some body wide decisions, and the stuff being reflected up uh, to involve um, to, to to simulate the the future. Um, and although I've got the the architecture for that in place, and I know it works. I haven't yet built enough of the brain to really need it. Um, there isn't a whole creature there, um, and so there are still some unknowns in in that respect. Um, I'm particularly so. There's two reasons why you want, might want to make a decision. One is because you have a drive, so it's a top-down decision. You, you know, I want to phone out for pizza because I'm hungry, and I know that if we have pizza, uh, I won't be hungry anymore. So that's a decision taken just on the basis of affect, on the basis of emotions. Um, but there are other decisions that happen ad hoc based on perception. So if I see a monster, um, I know it's a monster, I can see it, um, and I even know how I feel about monsters, so I can pass up information through the network to say, um, that, oh no, oh no, it's a monster, this is really important. So I have a salience mechanism uh, that, that um, says how important a stimulus is, but I don't really, I, I can't quite tie down the details of how that then reflects back down to become a decision. There's, there's a kind of dislocation in it. Um, we've got, on the one hand, I'm frightened, so I'll run away from where the monster is. And on the other hand, we've got oh no, I can see a monster, or I, I've looked at it, I'm staring at it, it's the subject of my attention. Um, but those two are slightly not connected to each other yet, and I can't, I'm, I'm still stuck a bit on how to pin them together. But it's, it's a pretty abstract and technical kind of a, <laughs> a problem. I'll get there. Great. Any further questions, folks? Okay, I guess um, uh, with, uh, uh, let, you know, uh, if there are none uh, for uh, a, a couple of items, um, our, I guess I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, <laughs> let's see. So I guess um, what we should do is we can wrap up here. There are, you know, the slides and the recording will be, on, will be online shortly. That's the first thing. Second thing uh, is our next seminar is going to be on January 31st, where Professor um, S.S. Iyengar will be talking about sensor-driven information technology for the next decade. With uh, see you then. Um, and before we all wrap up, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to unmute everybody. And Steve, as part of our tradition, uh, one of the things we do is uh, since we're all in disparate locations, we'll all we extend our speaker a warm virtual clap. So uh, every. <laughs> Everyone should be unmuted right now. Give me a second here while we do that. Uh, so please, let's all extend Steve a uh, very warm. Uh, <laughs>
so uh, Steve, I hope uh, uh, thank you very much for for a great presentation and uh, enlightening us with your research, uh, folks. You've seen Steve's contact information, so you reach out uh, or else go through me either way uh, but um, we'll all we'll see you guys all on January 31st for our next seminar uh, by Professor SS Iyengar and happy new year to all of you with that it's a wrap <laughs> thank you all right.